evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Ian Whitaker. I'm the assistant director for, for leadership programs here at the Chicago Council. Well, not here. Hey, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, the council is delighted to partner this evening with 1871. Uh, we're very grateful for the use of this fantastic event space here tonight as well. Uh, we have a great panel. We'll introduce them shortly. But first, just let me begin by saying that we are on the record tonight. We are live streaming, so, so welcome to everybody watching at home. Uh, we also we, wel we welcome social media and tweeting, but please uh, silence your phones during the program. If you haven't been to the Council's website recently, I would, I would encourage you to check out our exciting uh, agenda of fall programs. Some highlights include, just very quickly, October 13th, we have the New America Foundation President and CEO, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who will be talking about women, men, family and work. Uh, on October 20th, the Pakistani Prime Minister, His Excellency Nawaz Sharif, will be discussing the future of Pakistan. And on November 16th, I'm excited about this one, the Council is teaming up with the uh, Museum of Science and Industry for a panel discussion with some leading roboticists, Brenna Argall, Henry Christensen, and Robin Murphy. They'll be talking about future applications for robotics and artificial intelligence. C uh, council programs like these are membership supported, so if you're already a member, thank you very much. If you're not a member, you can join tonight for as little as $100. I also want to make a very uh, quick plug for the Council's Young Professionals Network which was recently described by Cranes as one of the top clubs in Chicago for ambitious millennials. Since we're 1871, I'm sure there are at least a few ambitious millennials here tonight. But for anybody, any young people who are interested in um, networking, socializing, uh, uh, and professional development in the city, check out our Young Professionals page on our website or, or speak to one of my colleagues. Uh, returning to this evening's program, I will come back shortly uh, to, to, to moderate the audience Q&A. But first, uh, to kick off tonight's discussion, Please join me in welcoming the CEO of 1871, Mr. Howard Tolman. Thank you, Ian. Um, how, many have, how many folks have been to 1871 before? All right, that's fair. So if you get a chance afterwards, please feel free to walk around. I, I want to just take a minute or two. First of all, I want to say that this is part of a continuing series of programs with the console. The first was an amazing opportunity for some of our uh, female entrepreneurs and some of our other uh, companies to sit and uh, meet with Madeleine Albright, which was pretty astonishing. This is at least a topper for that. So, um, although Bill Clinton was here last week, so you know it sort of comes and goes. Uh, but we're excited. This is really uh, all about Startup City, and our job as a nonprofit is to build businesses. Uh, right now, we have about 425 companies in 1871. The space is about 100,000 square feet. Uh, we'll announce later this week our expansion upstairs, another 45,000 square feet. And we expect to have about 100 more businesses, so almost 500 businesses by the end of the year. 1,600 people a day come here. Uh, we're global, so our members have reciprocity arrangements with uh, London, with Toronto, with Tel Aviv. Uh, with uh, cities now in Brazil, Colombia, in Turkey, and that's continuing to expand because honestly you can't build a business that's going to have an impact uh, if it isn't global. So uh, we're excited. We're just, I'm just about to head off to Japan and then to Cuba, uh, and you know, the whole world is being driven by technology. So uh, this is part of a program. We do about 1,000 events a year at 1871, about 350 workshops. Uh, we have all the universities represented here. We also have about seven or eight schools of our own. Uh, to give you some idea, this is really more than sort of just a real estate opportunity. It's, a, it's an education tool and a set of resources for the whole tech community. And probably the thing that I want to call to everyone's attention that we're most proud of is that we, this year we'll have one-on-one -on -one mentoring for our companies about 7,500 hours uh, delivered one-on-one -on -one, uh, for those companies by about 900 volunteer mentors. So it's a huge program. It's been very successful. And frankly, it's a win-win. Those companies who supply mentors, those individuals who come here uh, say all the time that getting a perspective on the future, getting exposed to some of this new, innovative, and disruptive technology is as much a win for them as it is for our companies to learn about uh, their domain expertise to regard them selfishly as potential customers and sort of all of the above. So uh, we're glad you're here and uh, we're excited about the program and I 
think, I'm not really sure, but I think I'm supposed to uh, introduce Jake and turn it over to Jake, who is the uh, uh, CEO of Cambridge Global Advisors and uh, is going to take it from here. So Jake, take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for having us here today. Um, as a member of both organizations, both the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and 1871, um, where we're both a tenant um, uh, and a, an emerging fund here, um, and soon to be um, uh, having one of our first investments, a cybersecurity startup, um, housed here as well, um, this reminds me of a conversation that uh, Madeleine Albright, who you mentioned previously, had with my partner, uh, Jane Lute, the former number two at Homeland Security, when she said, you know, Jane, what we're realizing is that there's this world of people who know how the world works, and they have one way they talk and that how they talk to each other, and they kind of understand each other's lexicon and, and uh, how to operate in, in, in that world. And then there's a world of people who understands how technology works, um, and they have their own lexicon and understanding of how that works. And the two worlds don't talk to each other, and nor do they understand each other's uh, um, way of communicating. And so today, um, the two groups have, have created an opportunity for um, some of the folks who know how the world works and some of the folks who know tech how technology works to start talking to each other um, as we uh, try and deal with some of the biggest uh, security um, policy and uh, business opportunities um, that, uh, that we're going to face in, in the modern era. I'd also like to quickly just recognize my class here. My, uh, I teach cyber policy at the University of Chicago Harris School, and a bunch of my students are here as well. Um, so uh, with that, um, to introduce the panel here. So Randall Cox um, is co-founder and chief scientist at RippleShot, um, uh, who uses big data analytics to detect data breaches and fraud. And they specialize in developing statistical models to identify credit card and ATM uh, fraud. And then Lindsay Rubenstein, is Vice President of Business and Supply Chain Systems at Boeing um, and has more than 17 years experience uh, there, uh, including leadership positions in strategy, operations, manufacturing, and so on. Um, and Tony Sager, uh, just uh, flew in today from Washington uh, to talk to you all. And uh, he has what I like to call the coolest job in history, which was to uh, hack into the NSA and then tell the NSA how to fix it. Um, so he did what they call red teaming for the NSA. Um, and now uh, uh, is the head of policy for a uh, think tank called um, the um, Center for Net Security, where they're trying to promote uh, best practice in, in uh, cyber hygiene. Um, so with that, I wanted to turn it over to the group with some, to make some uh, uh, brief remarks. Okay, hello. First of all, it's great to be here at 1871 with the ambitious millennials. I didn't know before accepting the offer to talk that I would be following Madeleine Albright and Bill Clinton, <laughs> but we'll hope to keep this interesting and, and exciting today. A little bit about myself. Um, first of all, I'm the vice president of IT for the Boeing company, which means I'm responsible for all the applications and uh, software for our corporate enterprise applications. Uh, prior to that, I led our cybersecurity operations and strategies, which included our, our red teaming that we spoke of, of earlier. Um, you know, just some basic comments before we get going with the panel. You know, if you look at a company like Boeing, we're one of the largest defense contractors. We're also the largest exporter in the U.S., and we also have one of the largest networks in the world. So obviously, we're a tremendous vector of attack for folks who are interested in our intellectual property. Uh, a couple comments I'd like to make just as why the, the challenge is so hard for companies like Boeing. And I will tell you, since we're streaming on YouTube, what I will say will have to be limited in very general nature, but I hope to use my expertise to give you some um, overview of the challenges that we face. Uh, one of them is, uh, you know, just complexity. And that's something people don't talk about. When you talk about global companies like Boeing, we're all over the world. Um, when you talk about placing work throughout the world that adds risk and complexity, um, when you do mergers and acquisitions, you're bringing in companies that may have a different security posture that you do. And you add on to that technologies like mobile, like the cloud. You used to have to go to IT to get those things. Now you can do it on your own. So the ability to control all these different dynamics is becoming more and more complex for large scale companies. Uh, you know, secondly, I think, and we'll talk about more, I'm sure, is, is cost and usability. Uh, the new technologies are out there, uh, reduce cost, allow companies to be more agile, 
um, but they also impact security. So facing those usability concerns is something that companies constantly uh, have to look at. And I think lastly, I call it creativity. Some people say the sophistication of the attacks is increasing. Um, I would change it to the creativity because I think it's not always highly complex. The big hacks that you've seen, whether they be Target or Ashley Madison, um, you know, they're, they're not as complex as they are creative and you're seeing adversaries, um, you know, not just send you emails with links, but they're getting into LinkedIn, they're getting into Facebook, areas you feel comfortable with you, enticing you to go there so they can um, essentially hack into your system. So those are three areas I think that make the challenge complex and I'm sure we'll get into more of those as we get to the end. Good evening. So I'm uh, Tony. I'm, um, I think I just passed 38 years now in the business that we now call cybersecurity and I started in, uh, it sounds so quaint, ComSec or communication security back in the 70s, a young mathematician uh, kind of the way people started their careers at the National Security Agency. So I've spent a lifetime, I uh, retired three years ago, uh, spent a lifetime sort of studying flaws. So all of my career at NSA, it's kind of an unusual career, all of it in the defensive mission that they call information assurance. I never actually worked in signals intelligence at all. But my, uh, my career is roughly in thirds, first third, sort of learning the craft of how systems break or how they can be manipulated to cause them to break, primarily through software. So I worked as a uh, cryptographic mathematician, software vulnerability analyst, and then sort of penetration tester, red teamer. So that was about the first third of my time. The second third uh, roughly focused on the management of organizations. So when you're managing things, you worry about optimization and good delivery and repeatability and training people and all that sort of stuff. And the, the last third of my career, I became consumed by a problem. Why is it that we keep finding the same problems over and over again when we test things? Uh, through whether it's in the operational environment through uh, like red team testing or in products or in software, over and over again, the same problems coming back. And then how do we translate this knowledge of what we're learning through flaws and the way systems break? How can we translate it into action? And a lot of things sort of occurred to me at that point that seem so obvious now, right? That these, these have grown past technical problems to become sort of behavioral problems. How do we help people see the right thing to do? And so that... That became the real last third of my career. And so I really, um, whatever you think of the National Security Agency, I spend a lot of my time in that last third opening up the mission. Uh, anything you see at NSA.gov that's uh, shared security guidance given away to the public came from my group, any of the work in open standards for security. So that was, and that wasn't just because I'm a nice guy, it's because I recognize that we have a shared problem, that we're all in this problem together. And it's not just bumper sticker, rah, rah, work together. It's, we really have mutual dependency. And even the big bad U.S. government with lots of money and time and people can't separate itself from this problem. So we have to find new ways to operate. So since I retired, uh, I tried to translate that idea into action in a nonprofit, as Jake mentioned, the Center for Internet Security. So when I'm asked what I do, I describe it as a community activist. I try to get people, whether they're in public sector or private sector, to work together to identify problems and solutions and then give them away, give those solutions away. So. If terms like the critical security controls, uh, the security benchmarks from the Center for Internet Security, things like that. So it's not just let's do good, it's here are specific things that represent better ways, better practices, and can we help people identify the barriers to putting those in place? What is it that prevents us from doing things that we, uh, that we know we ought to do and, and sort of manage this problem in a more uh, clever way and more in line with what we want from it? So. Uh, the other thing I have a particular interest in, and I think you, you might have questions about, is the role of the government in this. So I'm a lifelong big government guy, and uh, some of the best people I know work in the U.S. government with great skill and great dedication, and you know, I'm proud to have spent my career there. Uh, but it's time for a change in the role of the government in terms of its ability to bring people together. I grew up in a world where you know, the government sort of was the monopoly, right? Defined the problem, paid for the solution, decided who could participate, et cetera. We're in a different era now, and so we have to think of the different roles that we have to take, and that's why I've taken this sort of community organizer nonprofit approach, because I think that's a, a necessary part that is uh, not well developed yet in the way we, uh, uh, way we work together to solve this problem. So with that, I'll turn it over. My turn. <coughs> I'm Randall Cox, uh, chief scientist and one of the co-founders for Rippleshot. We're an 1871 company, one of the first that showed up in this place. And possibly the reason we're here is because we have an unusual take on data security. Instead of all the things you've done so much over the years, we look at 
a different data source, the transaction uh, stream that comes from our issuer partners. We know all the purchasing history of huge numbers of cards and the frauds. So we can use this to track back in time to find a common place where everybody shopped together and was subsequently uh, defrauded. This is where the fraud actually happened, where the cards were harvested. So it's a perspective that's kind of different from what you've had in that we have data that looks at it from an entirely different way. So I'm kind of interested to talk about the creative ways that hackers are now using to change the game. Great, so um, uh, just we've kind of collectively come up with a few questions uh, uh, to ask the panel and then uh, we'd love to hear uh, from all you. So um, first off, t Tony mentioned that uh, there's several different control sets, right? Uh, these uh, specifically the 20 critical controls that were developed by the NSA and um, now many, many groups use them. That's one set I think there's certainly others people refer to. But the point is, um, with most uh, problems that are out there in cybersecurity, there are generally speaking known fixes. Um, we know, uh, everybody talks about zero days and all these other crazy things, but, um, and, and those are important for us to deal with. However, as it stands right now, most organizations are, forget zero days, they're like leaving the door open and the lights on and waving to the burglars as they get in their car and drive away. And so the question is why, if we've known the right things to do um, for close to a decade now, why is it so hard for big organizations and people in the C-suite to be able to, to get their organization to implement these controls? So I'll, I'll turn it to our friend from Boeing first on that Sounds question. Sounds good. So, you know, I guess I'd ask the audience a question. How many of you know that exercise and eating well are, are good for you? Raise, raise a hand. And then how many of you actually do it? Okay, less hands. Um, I think when it comes to cybersecurity, you know, we talk about it, there's, there's TV shows, there's movies. Um, it's very sensationalized and people think it's very sexy. Um, the reality of it is one of the biggest things that you can do as a company is IT hygiene, which is not very sexy. Um, we're talking about patching your systems, making sure you have the most up-to-date software and hardware. Um, all those things are hard, and if you have thousands and thousands of assets, you have to prioritize what you're going to work on and, and the risk. So at the very base surface of it, um, I would say it's just very hard work and, and blocking and tackling, and that's challenging for a lot of companies. Um, I would say secondarily, there's trade-offs. So as I mentioned before, usability is very, very important. Um, I'd ask for a raise of hands, but we're videoing this. I don't want anyone to find out. But, you know, how many of you use two-factor authentication, a second form of authentication for your Gmail account or your AOL account, okay? Um, I was recently researching a software and benchmarking other companies. It was a, a cloud-based software. And they offered a second form of authentication to, to get into that application using SMS text on your phone. And only 1% of companies actually use that functionality, okay? And these are when you look at around large Fortune 500 companies. So I think that the usability factor um, is huge. And people, we want things simpler. We want them easy. We've talked about, you know, the ambitious millennials in the room. I mean, I think they're used to things having things quick and easy. And if it slows down productivity, we don't want it. So those are trade-offs that companies and businesses, um, you know, have to make all, all of the time. So those are two things that I would point to on, you know, just why it's hard and why it doesn't happen. I, I think the last thing I would talk to you is, um, you know, fundamentally it's cost. Uh, companies have to drive margins. They have to drive revenues. Um, doing things more securely is more expensive. Um, and you have to see that as a part of the cost of doing business like you would if you were in a retail sector where you know you're going to have theft, there's a certain percentage of theft, companies invest in that. They know and they protect, you know, physically protect their retail items knowing that's going to happen. And in some cases they say, you know what, it's not worth it. We're going to have some level of theft and we're going to accept that. So I think that that cost equation is also, you know, a significant barrier for companies. And Randall, I think that's kind of where you guys exist, right, is to, to help um, companies identify 
um, in terms of theft and, and uh, fraud and so on, you know, what, what are they going to invest in to, to deal with it and to what level? So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, in fact, I think I'd like to add a little bit about your what humans actually do. There is extensive research, behavioral research, about how people respond to inf low, high risk, but not very likely risk. We are terrible at this. And we have to realize that we're all going to be terrible at assessing whether or not it's worth diverting all those resources to fix the problem in the first place. We should all be spending a lot of time on that. But we also need quick and dirty ways to spot when the fire is started as quickly as possible, not after a huge amount of damage has been done. And that's really what Rebel Shot is all about, spotting things as quickly as possible, while not actually fixing the systematic problems that are still in place. So, to that end, um, Tony, when, uh, when you were at the NSA, um, you guys created many of these, or not created, but identified many of these key controls, um, and, and yet uh, Snowden happened after all that. Um, so clearly even the NSA had challenges implementing these known solutions. So can you talk about, you know, uh, for folks who are, you know, again, in the C-suite now trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to approach this? Is this a money problem? Is it a workforce problem? How do I get some of these key answers um, uh, um, implemented into my organization? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a lot of complexity to figuring out the right thing to do. There's a, there's a little phrase I use I call the defender's dilemma, right? So that this is what makes a defender's job so hard, right? You have to figure out what to do. You have to actually do it, which means get funding, support, people, training, and all that kind of stuff. And then you have to prove to lots of other people that you've done the right thing. And that third one is going to escalate dramatically because there isn't a, a law institute that's not in the cyber business. There's not an insurance company. There's not a regulator. Everybody wants to know what you're doing, right? They want some demonstration of the trust that they can place in you. And the, the gap from sort of good thing to do, you know, identifying something to actually doing it is, is huge. And we're, we're also at a, an awkward stage that I call the uh, uh, emergence from wizardry stage of cybersecurity, right? This idea that wizards, oh, it's so complicated only wizards can understand it. And, only, and so I, sh I need to hire some wizards who are preferably scruffy looking to tell me what to do. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, so senior executives, of course, they're trying to figure out the business issues, right? The imperative, the risk I'm taking, what should I spend? And they got a room full of wizards telling them, well, whatever it is you do, I'll give you five of the things you need to do. So it's a very complicated, you know, messy business to sort out and there isn't also a, uh, this, this emergence from wizardry. It also means we as a large community or as a society or groups of enterprises are just coming to agreement on the set of things that we all ought to do. Right? What should we do? What are the practices that make sense? And uh, I think that's a, you know, the way we do that in sort of other realms of society is we start to codify practices, right? Whether it's in law, regulation, building code, you know, you have to get inoculations before your kids are going to school. You know, we have a mix of sort of required things, uh, complemented with things that the marketplace can do to encourage or discourage certain behaviors, uh, followed by the way that we as individuals interact with each, with each other to encourage or discourage certain kind of behaviors. You know, whatever comes out will be some mix of all those. And it requires that we have some agreement around practices that make sense. So the example that Lindsay gave about sort of health, right? Th that's not people making it up. There's, there's decades of science and data, and you know, people have looked at these things to determine certain behaviors have positive or negative impact. And we start to build that you know, into the things that, that change people's behavior, that help them see the problem differently. And I would say, you know, for my friend here, the thing that's so different in the world that we're in now that was different when I started in the 70s is the presence of data about bad guys. We really knew nothing about bad guys back then, right? There was sort of one enemy. We didn't know much. It was all double top secret classified. And now we're actually drowning in data. And it comes from not sort of traditional places, but from transactional data, from the way people interact with systems and with each other. And we have the opportunity, actually, although things seem a little grim some days, we actually have the opportunity to learn lots of stuff that we could never have learned back you know, back when I was starting in this business. So that, that's what gives me hope around this. So, so I'd say, you know, in terms of barriers, it's making sure that we gain agreement and then it's not about advanced technology or wizardry, it's about how do we codify things 
encourage and move people in the right direction. So, so based on that, I want to go back to something you said earlier, because when you start saying things like codify and so on, they all of a sudden, you, uh, you know, the first place most people's head goes is, you know, government laws and so on and so forth. So the big question here is, you know, as we move into um, a situation where the, the cyber market is supposed to go from something like 79 billion to 190 billion in the next five years, um, you know, what's the role of government in all this? Um, I mean, Boeing, obviously, you guys have to deal with the government a lot. So um, uh, how, how do you see the appropriate role for government in this, uh, in this situation? Okay, so I think I'll start and then I'll let big government go. <laughs> um, <laughs> former big government. So, you know, I think the role of government and, and Boeing, you know, played a role in helping with the NIST standards, which essentially try and codify the basics around security controls and what's needed. And I think that's very appropriate. It allows small companies, mid-sized companies that maybe don't have the reach um, that big companies like Boeing do to sort of understand what are the basic block, block and tackling that I need to do to be successful. Um, every company needs to look at their risk posture. Uh, no company is the same. So you want to have basic standards, which I think the government is trying to drive at. But you don't necessarily want to make all these requirements because, again, what's important to one company that may have you know, criminal activity a as their vector of attack versus another company where it's intellectual property. There's a lot of similarities, but what you're going to want to focus on is different, and that's sort of the secret sauce that everyone needs to figure out in terms of, of, of the what and, and the how. But I think it's it's a great enabler for many, many companies to understand what the standard is versus having to create it on their own. So basically the point is that having government put the standards out there as kind of best practice, um, but not that we could pass this law, but, but passing a law to force people to do it is probably not the direction we want to go. Yeah. I would say keeping it voluntary is a, is a good approach, but I'll let, um, I'll let my <laughs> colleague here speak. Well, I, I gave some hints in my opening remarks about the, the ch what I think is a, the uh, important and shifting role of the federal government in particular, right? So, you know, a lot of us who grew up in my era, you know, we, we think of defense as a national defense issue. And that's a different time, right? Nation against nation, borders, geography separating us. Uh, and so the federal government, that's one of its roles, is to protect us from that kind of harm. And the cost of entry is very high, right, to build the kind of things that it takes. The cost of building an army is, you know, prohibitive, except at na national levels. So it's a very different problem. And uh, that problem still exists, but this problem is not that kind of problem, right? This problem is per pervasive in every action that we take as consumers, you know, in every uh, aspect of society. It's embedded in lots of things. So you, you cannot have the same role where government sort of is the monopoly definer, solver, payer of the problem. It just doesn't make any sense. And in fact, we as citizens won't put up with that. So we have to think of this as a more collaborative kind of activity and think of, you know, ab about this as primarily behavior change. You know, what is the right set of things that we all ought to encourage? I just can't see a world where we can uh, top-down mandate them. They're changing all the time anyway because of the complexity of the problem. And so thinking through what are the incentives, what are the barriers, uh, we need a lot more voluntary action, but not in, again, sort of kumbaya, rah, rah, let's work together way, but around specific things. Can we use the presence of the data that we didn't have before to identify, you know, if, if you don't know what the bad guy is capable of doing, that was the world I was in in the 70s, right? If that was our risk, how did you uh, determine wh uh, what that risk would be? Well, you hired geeky folks like me to pretend to be the bad guy and sort of attack ourselves and fix everything they found. And that only works in a time where you've got the luxury of long development times and lots of money. Now we're learning every day from the bad guys. One of my talks now is you know, how, how the attacker helps you define, uh, design your defense. Because we really do have the opportunity to look across vast uh, amounts of uh, free information given to us every day by you know, willing bad guys and then decide what are the practices that make sense to help us manage that. So r government takes a different role there, right? It's not the holder of all this knowledge. It's not going to pay the freight for all the solutions. It's going to take the marketplace. It's going to take you know, n knowledge, collaboration by uh, communities of different sort of interest. The government can play a tremendous role, though, I think, in the lots of things like being a better buyer, you know, better buyer of security practices, rather a better uh, a partner when it comes to uh, protecting information. 
And the government always plays a big role, I think, in, in creating what I call plumbing, how, how things talk to each other, which are primarily standards. Many times the marketplace is too fragmented to sort that out. The government can come in and be neutral, not about the content, but about the plumbing, how stuff moves from place to place. So the knowledge that's captured, for example, in, in exciting new technology, how shall we convey that to everybody? Are we going to email it to all our friends? I don't think so. I think we need standard ways to translate that knowledge into action so we can re, you know, uh, reconfigure our systems, block things, and so forth. And we don't want poor overworked humans trying to do that manually. We want standard plumbing to allow us to do that. So there's a big role in that that plays off of Lindsay's comment. Well, and so, so to that end, um, Randall, so if you've got massively huge organizations like Boeing who are trying to wrap their arms around this, you've got the government putting standards out there that are starting to be considered best practice and that we know attorneys are going to start litigating around um, the government dipping its toe in regulation and so on. Um, and you've got an industry that's going to potentially more than double in the next two years from $75 billion to um, $190 billion, if those numbers are right. So as a startup, what do you see as like the business opportunities for startups in this space? I mean, with all the complexity here um, and the need to get this right, um, what, what do you see out there as the emerging trends in terms of uh, entrepreneurship? Actually, going slightly back to the government role, I <coughs> part of this market uh, potential is all about strange misperceptions, old-fashioned perceptions, I think, about the way government was supposed to pick up the pieces for us, as if somehow they were this guy on a white horse or something. And even now, when I see uh, merchants and issuers <coughs> realizing that they're maybe getting something from the, the uh, NSA or somebody else, months too late to do something about it, they still think that they're supposed to have that opportunity. So it's, I think it's pretty interesting that it's taking us a long time even though the evidence is on the ground that we can't do it that way, we still have that thing running around in the back of our head. I'm not really sure how to get around that. <clears throat> but certainly there is a huge opportunity for lots of companies. Uh, our estimates are tens of billions of dollars in just the breach detection market. Uh, there are certainly lots of problems that are just laying on the ground that people in big companies don't have the time to fix right now. And they're telling everybody what those problems are. So all we have to do is listen and step out of the plate. Well, there's some other stuff involved, but. Yeah, I mean, I think automation is certainly one of those. I mean, one of the biggest problems we have is we don't have a uh, trained workforce that can do a lot of the stuff that um, we need done. And um, as you've talked about kind of the mundane knuckle dragging exercises that need to be implemented to kind of get this stuff done, well, knuckle dragging is unfortunately done by people, right? And so until we can, uh, get enough people who know how to do this stuff. Automation, I think, is probably one of the biggest business opportunities. Um, so, how are we on time? Okay, we're on time. Awesome. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, sure. someplace that might be able to, as soon as something comes in, be able to hack back right away, and then that tells the bad guys, don't touch this before it gets to be a problem. A anything on hack back for the government or business? Or so I don't know if you guys heard the beginning of the question. So uh, it's this um, question about hack back, as you said. So can the private sector, um, once they're attacked, go back and, and, uh, and hack back to get to uh, advert? And, like the civilian side of government. I have one comment about, about this. There's a strange asymmetry between what the hackers are doing and what we might do as a, in a hackback environment. The hackers have a limit. They're not omnipotent. They don't know how to break into every single target. They have a small toolkit that they know well, and they know a few companies out there, for example, are going to be vulnerable to this attack. So they try 
a hundred different targets. When they get in once, they make off with credit cards or uh, medical records or whatever else and sell them for whatever. But if you on the other side responding to some Russian hacker breaking into you, in order to hack back, you need to be able to break through their security. And you also have a limited set of tools. You're not always going to be able to reciprocate this. So this basic asymmetry makes this approach somewhat limited. I mean, there are, there are, there's a limit to what you would accomplish. I'm not saying it won't be very effective in some circumstances, but this is a problem that you always have to keep in mind. So, do you want to talk about what your attorneys would say about this at Boeing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, obviously, there, there's tremendous legal implications of this, and I think it's something that is debated, is discussed widely. Um, I think there's a lot of concerns, and I think, especially as we start, start to talk about cyber escalation, the potential into, the, into some sort of large-scale cyber war, um, and the ability for people who are in business in the private sector to really know the, the appropriate steps to take. I think there's probably, you know, there's measures that are um, maybe not hacked back, but, you know, a lot of companies look at where they may place um, materials that are, you know, they call it a honeypot, where it's not exactly the real designs or the real information to try and understand the adversary. It's, it's, it's a lighter version of what you're saying. It's more of a defensive um, posture to get an understanding of what they're doing and, and blocking the adversary. Um, but, it, but I think it's a very, it's a very good question, a very controversial topic on, on many angles. Well, two, two quick things. One is I think for, for any individual enterprise, whether it's commercial or government, um, this, this uh, notion of hacking back is just not worth your consideration. It's too perilous technically, legally, uh, operationally. You know, it's just not – at a national level, right, the conversation has to leave the technical domain, though. So you see a little bit from the administration now, right? So you, you, you can't think of this as a, we're just fighting over the wire because you never win that fight. You have to think of the other – the, the term is the other instruments of national power. So political pressure, sanctions, economic, you know, there are too many. And, and you're seeing some of that play out now. Yeah. It's not as satisfying, you know. There are certainly more active things we could all do in defense, right, in terms of the, the things that we do to manage ourselves, to actively, um, you know, work the adversary, cause them more cost and so forth. There's things you can do with your upstream service providers that are much more active than you can do for yourself. But beyond that, I wouldn't even think of it as an option, to be I'll honest. open this up to some more uh, audience Q&A just now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll send a, a microphone over to you. And um, please make sure that your question is a question to you. Um, so first there, uh, and then third row back there. Hi, thanks for coming. That's all pretty interesting. Um, you know, just trying to tie together a few concepts you all uh, talking about. I've been doing some research lately on data centers, and you know we've got this big one here at, at Surmac Road. You know, depending who you ask, it's either the largest or second largest in the world, et cetera. All the interconnect in Chicago, in and out. How protected is something like that? Uh, and you know, you know, given what you, your own experiences are, um, you know, is is something like that? Uh, vulnerable is it is it attacked frequently um, you know by you know small toolkits large toolkits or, or whatever and um, you know uh, we, we can do a lot right sitting at our computers but what if what if you know people take out a couple of these big data centers and, and given how the the net really works it seems like those things are, are much more important these days than worrying about like our devices so it seems like yet uh, um Two questions there, uh, both of which were pretty interesting. One is specifically about data center here, but two is um, 
is it more important to protect our data or our networks? It sounds like it's kind of where, where that went at the end. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then the specific question is about the Sure. I have, I guess, one comment about it. As an application developer, from my own experience, I'm always going to assume that the network I'm running on is insecure. And I will never, ever rely on them for whatever it is that they're going to do to stop outside attacks. So I spend a great deal of time essentially hardening my data by either not having anything that's sensitive to outside hackers or transforming it in a way that it's unrecoverable even by me so that nobody else can get that data out of here. And I think this is a, something that pretty much everybody at 1871 is doing all the time, figuring out how to live deftly in an environment that is just dangerous. Yeah, I, I would just add, um, with any good information security program, the key is having layered defenses. So it's not any one thing, it's at the application layer, the database, the physical security of your environment. All those things are incredibly important because like was mentioned, um, at any point someone's gonna get through one of the layers. And so that, that really is the key to any good security program. And for any of you who have responsibility over these assets, I think the best way to know if your environment is at risk is um, if you don't have the skills internally is to at least get you know a very simple third party assessment where they'll evaluate your controls and get a baseline and then if you feel like you need to go further you know doing more of the penetration testing in front of some of the vulnerability assessments well they'll act like the adversary and see if they can exploit your environment but those are two things that are you know pretty simple and commonplace to start if you want to start important to understand how protected your data is any more questions, Mr. Rubenstein? Just wait for the microphone, I'm sorry. Yes. How, how important is um, sharing, the ability to share among organizations? And, and obviously, I think there's been a bill before Congress to, to uh, facilitate that to some extent. So I, I assume you all would support that, that type of legislation and, but, but uh, sharing on a, on a timely basis. And how, what's your view on how important that is? So Tony was just talking about this to my class an hour ago and has kind of a contrarian view. Of it. It's okay. <laughs> well, I have a talk I give. I consider, it, I, I call it the, uh, the subtitle is a career death wish in this, inside the DC Beltway. Uh, the, the title of the talk is information sharing is overrated. <laughs> and uh, I don't, it's not because I'm a curmudgeon about information or I'm a hoarder of information. It's that, you know, it's become this catchphrase of a, sort of a miracle cure, right? If we just shared, if the government would just share everything it knew, then we'd all be really smart, then we'd solve the problem, and we'd be good to go, right? It, it's, it's hopelessly naive. Uh, we actually, the, the vast majority of what, here's, I'm gonna offer an opinion, the vast majority of what you need to know to defend yourself is already out there, right? Available in the public to you. So that's, that's one issue. However, uh, there are lots of things happening anyway to share information, right? This, this whole, uh, legislation, you know, we need to wait for the government to save us again and pass legislation to protect us. Get over that. Companies like yours share all the time with their close partners, work very closely uh, because they have a common problem and they're trying to solve it together. So that's one thing. The other part two of that information sharing is overrated is people keep forgetting the purpose of sharing information is not so we get more information to share, right? It's a means to an end. It's a means to define action. What should we do based upon that information, right? It's not how clever you know, Randall's folks are, it's what can people do about it. And that translation into action is really the hard part. And so for the vast majority of us who are just trying to survive in this, we don't want to read thousands of pages of threat reports. We don't want to subscribe to hundreds of threat feeds. We want to know what to do so we don't have to pay so much attention to that. So that, I think, doesn't get nearly enough emphasis in the discussion. 
yes, there are uh, you know uh, highly sensitive, well-funded organizations that are willing to spend whatever it takes to learn about those two people in this country with this interest attacking me, but that's so far off the scale, you know, for most of us. So, so uh, it's not that I don't believe in sharing. It's just I think there's lots going on already, and this translation to action is really the the, the key to solution, not not the actual sharing, and that that's it's become this sort of catchphrase for um, you know for progress when it really is not. So, so that being said, the, um, the do you want to talk about the Dib pilot, which was widely considered to be very successful and probably the yeah, so the government um, set up a pilot for information sharing for the major defense uh, contractors for the purpose of um, information sharing. And I think within specific industries, um, the financial industry has uh, intelligence sharing. Um, there's another uh, other industries that are uh, under attack where there's been a lot of value in um, not just the intelligence sharing, but the collaboration on approaches and, and overall design. So um, I would definitely say there's a lot of um, good and value that's come of it, but I would agree that if you're a, a small company, you probably don't need that level of intelligence. And again, it's going to get more down to the basic blocking and tracking. So a sort of narrow disagreement with you two. For certain types of data, though, the sharing can be really profound. Um, and I, perhaps... The, the difference in the way we're looking at it is um, I'm looking at extremely regular, highly um, highly processable data, whereas you're looking at alerts, things that humans need to look at. And that's really hard, of course, to make use of in a shared environment. But sheer volume of data is often extremely helpful. Um, our technology detects breaches four times faster when we have twice as much data. So it's one of our selling points, in fact, that when we're talking to issuers, we're going to have uh, data from you and data from your neighbors and data from all across the country, and you'll now be able to detect things way faster than you would have by yourself. And so I, I guess there are two different sides of this. And there's, there's another uh, point I usually make when I talk about information sharing. We, we always should think of it at two levels. I'll call it tactical and strategic, right? So tactical says, I learn about a breach. Bad thing happened, block this port. Bad thing happened, go look for this file and delete it. You know, that, and that's a world that we all live in, right? And we, we do our best to survive there. But um, there's a strategic level of this. If I look across a million incidents, what is the common root cause that allows those to happen? There's not nearly enough analysis going on about the sort of root cause, basic, you know, what action can I take so I don't have to pay attention to a million things. And, it, and many of those are actually hard, right? They involve uh, new technology, uh, re-architecture, isolation, you know, different ways to think about it. But if we don't do both of those, so we have to survive in today's world, right? We've got to find what's going on, get the bad guys, get them out. We also need to rethink the way we do things fundamentally, which takes time, which takes resources, and takes understanding of what it is bad guys can do. So someone has to stand back from the pile you know, the pile of things that are happening every day and look at these sort of trends, architectural changes, because if we don't do that, we will never, you know, never be able to keep up. We can, do, we can go faster and faster with dealing with today's incidents, but we'll never get ahead of it. So I think you have to think of it both tactically and strategically. Thanks. So any more questions? Uh, kind of in the center there, with over there. Thank you. I wanted to go back to <coughs> behavior for a second and uh, responsibilities that organizations should have. I, I'm seeing now that you know, organizations were having their IP hacked years ago in the 90s. Everything hitting the firewalls was out of China. Uh, organizations had their information stolen. The push now is due diligence on behalf of the consumer, which is what I'm seeing driving all of this. As people's health records get stolen and other personal information, now you're seeing folks respond. I mean, you know, Sony had seven times they were hacked before it became a real problem, right? Now FTC should be looking at folks about what they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, when wireless routers came out, it wasn't until they mandated that you encrypt it, you use it, you know, encryption on the, on the, on the wire, on the wireless piece, that folks started using those. Consumers can't know that. I can't know that some television in my house is like taking pictures of me and sending it someplace, right? 
So what role does the government have when it comes to you know, consumer protections and, in, and ensuring that organizations do their appropriate due diligence to make sure that what I would never know as a consumer is actually protected? I'll, I'll leave this open. I mean, um, so those are good examples of where government can bring visibility to a problem, right? As opposed to sort of mandating, here's all the requirements on a smart TV, for example, to prevent those. So if you look at the work of, uh, I've been talking a fair amount to the Federal Trade Commission, right? You know, someone asked me a couple years ago, I gave a talk, they asked me to give a talk on something I know very little about, which is what's happening in cyber legislation? And my conclusion to the audience was, probably 18 months ago, I said, don't waste your time watching legislation. Go look at the regulatory agencies. That's where the action is. Every regulatory agency in DC thinks they're in the cyber business now. And they're holding hearings, putting out opinions, et cetera, et cetera, right? And they're all trying to figure out what role should they be playing in this. So the FTC has been one of the most active, I'd say, in defining practices, uh, bringing attention to things that don't look right from the perspective of as a consumer. So as opposed to trying to regulate everything, I think uh, government can play a great role in bringing visibility to these kinds of problems and let the market sort of put pressure there, you know, because, I mean, th those should make you uncomfortable, right? You know, what is my smart TV so smart about here and why does it need to be on by default and all that, those kinds of things? So I think um, providing a neutral place to clear that kind of information, to, to uh, share it very broadly, and, you know, when necessary, you know, bring uh, uh, pressure or at least the threat of regulation, I think, brings a lot of attention, certainly in the D.C. area. I think one of the other pieces to this is there's the point about the regulators is because the consumers don't have um, as much of an advocacy organization lobbying for them on the Hill on this, or certainly not a powerful one, um, and the industries that may be regulated have incredibly powerful lobbyists. Um, the idea that a bill is going to pass um, on this anytime soon is is highly unlikely. However, the, the regulators might wind, and what we're seeing actually happen is that the regulators are getting involved. Attorney, you know, uh, smart attorneys are figuring out ways to um, uh, sue companies for uh, the specifically these issues, and this is starting to be figured out in the courts. Um, through case law, and it seems like that's probably how this is going to play out. Um, yeah, the, just a side thing, the fascinating thing to me is if you follow the, the world of vulnerability disclosure and things like that, this has been my world, right, finding problems and how they get, how they get fixed. Uh, you know, regulatory agencies do not need to hire a room full of cyber, uh, we, uh, I'm sorry, wonks to figure this out. All they got to, you know, people will come out of the woodwork to voluntarily find hacks against cars and refrigerators and any new thing that's out there, right? And, you know, it's irritating sometimes to government folks and to the vendors and all that kind of stuff. It's noisy, it's messy. But at the end of the day, we're getting a lot of information about what can go wrong and starting to change our expectations of what we should... The, the challenge is, can we codify that into the way we ask for things? So th there was an earlier question about the, uh, you know, sort of big data centers, right? You know, we're still figuring out, how, how do I, as a consumer, whether I move my stuff to the Amazon cloud or iCloud or to a, somebody's data center, how do I demand better security in the service level agreement? What are the practices I should ask for? What, what reports should I request that would allow me? Because at the end of the day, I'm probably regulated by somebody else, and I've got to prove to them that I've done the right thing. So these are the kind of things I think we need to figure out, and what practice uh, allows me to b have better confidence and convey it to others. That, that defender's dilemma I talked about, right? How do I do the right thing and prove to others I did the right thing? Um, I'd also, last, last point that Lindsay brought up, and I, I'd say bigger than small, small businesses, small, medium, and frankly, almost every federal agency I've ever worked with cannot solve this problem on their own. And they'd be better off, frankly, outsourcing it, going to a managed service provider, <laughs> right? B working with someone else. It's just too hard to get the people and the technology and so forth in place. Yeah, yeah there, are, there, are, you know, there are great companies. I, I have w done some work with Boeing in the past. They're great, great folks you know, that know what they're doing in cybersecurity. But again, that, that's not the rule. That's the exception. And that's driven by the you know the market that they serve, at least in the, the part that I know of. It's sort of interesting that getting these people who have figured out that your TV is being hacked <coughs> because of some vulnerability, the, it used to be very expensive for that information to get from somebody who was looking into it to regulatory agencies. But clearly, social media has now really reduced that cost. So it's now almost free for somebody to say, Apple, you've been tracking where my phone is because it's stored on your phone. 
that's a problem. Suddenly, the whole net knew about it tomorrow. So maybe social media is another tool in, in everybody's security toolkit. Yeah, it, it's messy and different, right? Because again, from the federal government perspective, you want like, oh, that, oh, that, oh, there's a flaw in this that could be exploited. Oh, that's super sensitive, no one should know about it. Well, that's not the way this works. You know, somebody finds it out, they want everybody to know about it, right? And some, you know, people are struggling with the, do I go to the vendor first? How much time do I give them to fix it? And that sort of thing. But, you know, the availability of this kind of information about flaws gives us the opportunity, I think, to, to address some of these or to demand better as consumers. And way faster than we used to. Good. Any more questions? The second row there, please. So I want to bring this back to the C-suite and the board level. Um, obviously, when we look at how this plays out in corporate organizations, the chief security officer is two or more levels removed from the CEO most of the time. That person likely has never seen the inside of the boardroom. There's nobody in the board who knows anything about this, nor is there likely to be in the near future anybody on the board who is a real cyber expert. So what is it that companies should be doing to elevate this given the corporate realities, that the, C that the chief security officer is unlikely to be a direct report to the CEO, there's nobody in the board who's likely to be a, secure, a cyber expert, what is it that companies can do in the meantime to make sure this gets the level of attention it should? So I, I actually think you pointed to some very good solutions. Um, I do believe that cybersecurity is very much getting attention at boards. If you look at any cybersecurity conference, this is a major topic uh, of interest and it definitely has the board's attention. I think what you brought up in terms of structure, I think in a lot of cases when you look at some of the recent acts, um, the chief information security officer was buried many levels below. So I think structure and where it reports to is very important. Um, I also think like you brought up on boards, um, we don't put generalists in place to do the financial audits, right? We have very specialists on the boards who have done this. And I think it's only a matter of time before we start putting cybersecurity experts um, on boards or you know, very senior IT people who have the, the background there. Um, I think lastly, um, boards are getting educated through third parties. There's a lot of materials out there in terms of, and the government has published many of those in terms of what are the good questions that boards should ask and where should they focus their energy and how do they make sure that the right investments are being made. Um, but I think the first two over time are, are going to need to happen for, for success. Any further questions? Uh, in the front row here, please. Thank you. Are we making perhaps a Faustian bargain with the technology? I mean, are we? is this the type of thing where we're making things so complicated and so interrelated that we're making ourselves vulnerable to the point of perhaps guaranteeing our doom? That is, perhaps we can't defend against all of the attacks. In time of war, do you really want your water system and your electric system interconnected on the internet, for example? Couldn't these be set up as discrete systems that can't be hacked from the mountains of Uzbekistan, for example? Uh, and with cars, with the, you know, I do not want, I, you know, I, I may be a Luddite, and I have an old older car, and I've had older cars, but when I'm going down the road, I don't want anyone to be able to hack into my car. Uh, it, I just want to, I mean, philosophically, as a society, are we making a mistake because of all of the convenience and all of the gee whiz that we're getting out of this that we're setting ourselves up? Are we setting ourselves up for major problems? I actually have a comment for, from the perspective of complexity theory and information theory. Um, there's a lot of work that shows that what systems are brittle and which systems are extremely robust to perturbations. And highly interconnected things have lots of problems in terms of vulnerabilities to specific things, but the entire system doesn't go down. You tend to have deformations rather than catastrophic failures. Think about ecologies on the planet. The most robust ecologies are the ones that have many, many players that are 
tightly linked to one another. So yes, you're, these complicated systems, biological systems, have cases where there's a sudden extinction and you didn't really expect that, but the system as a whole is still not completely destroyed. So perhaps we're underestimating the, not only the benefits in terms of cool new things you can do, but also the robustness just from the being connected to a lot of other things gives you. So since you brought up the cars per, um, point, and since you know at one of the big hacker conferences uh, this year, you know they hacked a bunch of a bunch of cars. What's interesting to to me about your question is is actually the the difference between how people over forty view this problem and the difference between how millennials view this problem. Um, so I moderated a panel as for one of the big car companies who was talking to a bunch of people in Washington about um, automated cars and. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody was up in arms about the cybersecurity and, like, some people are going to hack the car and drive us all off cliffs and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, I mean, look, it's a legitimate concern. S but there was nobody under 30 in the room. So I went and talked to a bunch of my students about this issue. And they were like, well, wait a second. So that means that, like, drunk drivers can just get in the car and push a button and the car will drive them home? And, you know, and I was like, well, uh, yeah, ostensibly yes. And they're like, oh, well, that'd be way better than what we have today. <laughs> you know, because they they trust the people using the technology far less than they checked um, the technology to, to work correctly. Correctly. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, right. Maybe not forty. Um, so anyway, so uh, I th the the interesting thing I think is is how future leaders are going to deal with exactly that question. I think they look at it far differently than we do. Any more questions in the pink shirt there? Thank you. Um, this is a question, I guess, primarily for Randall. Um, but I'm interested in sort of, obviously, there's been a lot of challenges around the EMV transition. Um, and you know things like the US choosing to go primarily chip and signature versus chip and pin. Um, you know, and I, I see a lot of this as sort of a, that trade-off that we were talking about earlier about usability versus security. And you know, I guess if you could maybe just sort of speak a little bit about how you see sort of um, issuers in particular and other businesses in the payment space sort of balancing usability versus uh, security and why that's sort of gone in a different way in the US, you think, versus sort of the rest of the world where you're even seeing things like sort of mandatory two-factor for online purchases and things like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I live in this universe all the time and I'm still astonished what has happened in the United States, that we've moved after a really long time. Finally, we've come to EMV this month, theoretically. Most of us still haven't done it. Some businesses that want desperately to do it can't do it because something upstream has made it impossible. And chip and signature is the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> People have made, I, I take a kind of realistic attitude toward all this. All sorts of weird political decisions are made about whether or not we're gonna do chip and signature because some people can't get around to doing chip and pin. Even if those are fake reasons for not getting things done, they are still what's happening on the ground. And what I'm seeing is that we're moving into putting EMV in place. We're having things like Apple Pay, other companies like us, we're bringing some additional layers of security to all of this. Yes, many of the things that we're trying to implement will be complete garbage, but we have a lot of them piled on top of one another. That's the layering strategy that Lindsay was talking about. And together, I'm still sort of hoping that that ecological approach will still get us where we need to go. On the far side in the black. So to kind of go back to this idea about there not being the consumer lobbies um, in Washington, I'm very curious about you know this idea that um, we have certain government regulations for things like food that are a public safety issue. And I, I think that cybersecurity sort of steps into that same domain because Lindsay, you made the example of um, you know companies make a decision about how much they're willing to have stolen from them, but that's a piece of, piece of clothing and now we're talking about people's 
medical records and their you know financial records and so how does that change this conversation when we're talking about things that are actually much larger than the company itself we're talking about a public safety issue uh, so, <laughs> um, so I mean I think you know this point about uh, hygiene that Tony has talked well that everybody on the panel has talked about um, you know you can go back to uh, the seatbelt in the in the car, right? Like you wouldn't, you would never even dream of buying a car today that didn't have anti-lock brakes and seatbelts and airbags and everything else. But that wasn't always the case, right? There was a certain number of people who, you know, uh, died or uh, you know were injured in car accidents until Ralph Nader came around and there's this big public outcry and they they changed it all and we're just not there yet in cyber. I don't know what point is in which we do get that, you know, the the citizenry becomes its own lobbyist. Um, uh, there, this hasn't happened yet, and the 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 guys with the with the high paid lobbyists still are are kind of going to win that game for for the time being. We've got time for one more question. Uh, and the towards the back there next to the pillar. Thanks. Sorry, Tony. Uh, so, given law enforcement's requests for additional observation ability into online services, uh, how do you see that playing into the creation of what would be otherwise, com say, hypothetically completely secure systems that now have to have some holes opened in it to enable law enforcement obser observation ability? Public safety on both ends, if you will. For example, the controversy between national security agencies of various sorts and Apple, for example, saying that they're encrypting everything on the device so that even they can't get at it, regardless of the, the query made by law enforcement. That's a hard problem, balancing public safety, perhaps, and privacy. We're clearly going to be talking about that for a really long time, and I think it's above my pay grade to decide how it's going to play out in the end. But you're right, it certainly does open, if you're forced to open it, a backdoor for a security agency, I am quite sure that brilliant hackers out there will talk to their buddy at the security agency, learn things that they shouldn't learn, and suddenly be able to get access to my photos from vacation or, or something more sensitive. It's a big problem we're going to be wrestling with for a long time. Not a very satisfying answer, I'm sure. All right. Um, well, I'll just say, so given my background and uh, uh, a survivor of the original crypto wars in the early 90s, if anyone's old enough to remember those, uh, the clipper chip, does that ring a bell? Law enforcement yeah. access field? Yep. Someone left that. I was actually on assignment um, in, a, in a different uh, part of the country, and someone left an uh, article of that on my desk, and I came back and I thought it was an April Fool's joke. I thought, who in the world thinks they're going to sell this idea to the public? <laughs> so it turned out it wasn't. Um, I, I don't. I mean, I don't have. A, obviously, lots of senior people in the government have spoken up about this. I, I will tell you this, though, as a, as a concerned citizen, my my inclination is pushed stronger for much better privacy protection for for all citizens, for all consumers. Uh, I think the law enforcement things and the intelligence things, frankly, whatever it takes, they'll make it work. And I'm not I'm not concerned that that's going to be the the barrier to prosecuting bad guys or uh, counter espionage. Great. Well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. But, but please uh, join me in, in thanking our speakers tonight. And, uh, <laughs>